what what has your mind been flooded by well i'm there in italy for one thing i'm a complete mountain man right now because i haven't shaved or my fingernails i've never had them this long in my life you got no woman to keep you in check <laughs> yeah and, I, and i'm kind of liking it. i want to see how long they grow <laughs> Like a dead man, like one of these found Egyptian mummies, right? Where they're all kind of yeah. down, right? <laughs> so I'm kind of liking the isolation of it. It's uh, it's shocking, but the days fly by for me, even though I'm prison a prisoner in my hotel room with the window closed and everything, like the curtains closed. But the days fly by because, it, like, I'll lay in my bed looking up at the ceiling for two hours and just think, and the thought comes to me, and I reach over and write it in a notebook, and then I think some more, and I write it and so I, I guess what I realize is in the last number of years, I haven't had that. So my uh, contemplation time is just incredible to me. And I have to mm-hmm. maintain this going forward, this momentum going forward and go back to Romania for sure. Are you going out of the house or out of the room? Only when they want to clean. And I only let her clean my room every three days. So like, I, yeah, I go for breakfast in the morning. There's a breakfast down below me. Yeah. which is a nice little breakfast. And I, I go down at seven o'clock in the morning, I have a breakfast, have coffee, do a little bit of people watching for 45 minutes and come back to my room for the day. And uh, so I don't have to leave this hotel. I have everything self-contained here. And she cleans my room every three days or so. And then when she does, I'll go for a walk. So, hmm. but other than that, I don't really leave. <laughs> so it's like you've bought yourself six days a week of sitting in your room where nothing can possibly distract you. Not the internet, not yeah. Diana, not anyone, not any of the nothing. thousands of people that come through the city like Bucharest on a weekly basis. No, I don't even contact Diana. I, I talked to her for a long time this morning. And that's the first time in almost well, basically a week. It's incredible. Good for her and good for me and good for the, it's uh, good for the, I don't know. It just makes me realize, you know, we, we talked last week at about the shifting of ours and Murata, you know, where yeah. it has to go. It's coming clearer and clearer in my mind. And, um, and it's going to completely shift in a really strong, good way. And uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. So what, what are some of the ideas that have come through the last seven days since we spoke? Well, it's more of a deepening of what we talked about, I think. The idea that um, that we recognize, you know, we have to recognize the 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 place in in, in history that we are, hmm. you know? Because we're in, we're in a shifting of eras, you know, just like in, you know, about 1890, there was a shifting of eras when, you know, um, science came along and said, wait, Newton's, Newton's um, physics is, is out the window and relativity and, you know, and, and atoms and uncertainty and all this certain, you know, thing that we thought the world was certain and the universe is certain is not certain. At the same time, they just, you know, they deconstructed art with cubism and that kind of thing. Everything all happened at once. Hmm. Music was deconstructed. Um, science. Um, the World War. It just there was a major upheaval at the turn of the last, you know, the 1900s. And it feels like we're on the edge of some other upheaval again. Yeah. Where, because, I mean, everything's been explored. If you look at... You look at painting, for instance, right? It was representation, representation. First, it was religious art, then representation. They get more accurate, more accurate, more accurate, and Vermeer, and and then photography came along. And so the painters immediately switched to, okay, let's not be representation. Let's go and find out what is the essence of Jordan instead of painting his face and his shirt. What is before me? And that's impressionism and cubism and, you know, Hmm. and, and, right down to the point where you go into modern museums and there's just a blue canvas. Yeah. Red it's square. Construct right down to the essence of, of nothing, but it's just a, you know, so, so what's next? You, do you go back to representation? It's been explored, you know, right now there's, there's painting a photorealism painting. You've seen that on the internet where, where somebody will take a girl in water swishing her hair 
and it looks like a photograph, but it's really a painting. That's how right. accurate the materials have become. So they couldn't do that 200 years ago because painting and pigments and stuff and brushes couldn't do it. Right. Now, technologically, right. they can do it, right? And artistically and, you know, understanding depth and all the kinds of stuff, they can do it. So you have that photorealism on one side to break down to nothing, a simple black line on, on a canvas. And that's, or, or, you know, in sculpture too. So what else is there? What can the next era of painting be? Yeah, culture war. You've got every end of every polarity all yeah. fighting each other. And it's out explored there in the scene. to death. So somebody brand new comes along and says, I want to be a painter. What do they paint? A mountain? What do they paint? Everything is, you know, has been captured before photorealism down to a simple line to the impression of something so what is it a new jordan that you know turns to 19 goes to art school and he wants to become a painter what's he going to paint that hasn't been done what is you know when you know when <laughs> and same with you know things like music yeah so you map so, the same trend in every every art yeah. music literature poetry to the nth degree and so now where where but it is going to change, but to what? That if we can put our finger on that, because art, music, literature, literature followed the same thing. 1910, 1920, where people used to write stories and swashbuckling stories of swinging through sails. And, and once upon a time, there's a guy named Jordan and he went and saved the girl. And all, you know, all, all that kind of literature shifted into, I'm thinking this right now and I'm just kind of stuck in my head and, stream of consciousness and <laughs> yeah. all the way up to fin Finnegan's wake with, you know, with, with James Joyce, with just nonsense rhymes and just took language and put language out front. Didn't have any real meaning, but you go, huh? But it's, it's the flow and structure. So what do you do with literature? Go back to stories. What do you, what's after, you know, what do you, what do you go? Where does it go? It's interesting. It has to go somewhere. Right. Right. And, uh, but we're facing some kind of cultural apocalypse mm -hmm. where everything's been done. And I think there's also um, a nihilism or a tiredness within the whole thing. Yeah. Absurdism. Yeah. So you think it, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this, like, like all of errors end and start by somebody like Einstein sitting there. Einstein erased all he knew about mathematics and physics which wasn't much when he was young. And he just sat and looked out the window during his day job and just thought, what if a beam of light came here and hit me in the eye? What would it, and he was just daydreaming. And so he invented a brand new physics conceptually in his head just by thinking about it, you know? And all of these eras that shifted into something new is because somebody said they tried to go like a child to find what is a color? What is the shape of a woman? What is that? Like that's until it's down to a single line, right? That's the essence of it. So what hasn't been uh, contemplated and shifted into is the, this transcendent thing we're talking about. Yeah. Right now there's, you know, there's always been a religion has dominated the world forever. There's no such thing as atheism like 200 years ago. It just didn't exist. And then the enlightenment came along, rationalism stuff at. Yeah. And they said, wait a minute, so now I can be an atheist, atheist and now I don't have to believe in God. So they went to that nth degree of that. But there's something has to happen there because there's nothing in between. There's, you're, either, you're either a spiritual slash religious person, which is wrong according to atheists, or you're a staunch atheist, which is wrong according to the religious people. There's nothing in between, you know? So why, you know, and so, so what what revolution has to happen in the mind so that we can say, yes, there is, for instance, a soul and science is primary as opposed to you, you guys are wrong, you know? So I don't know what it is. But so something. In integrating. Well, no, because my, here's me laying in bed. I'm thinking, if you think of any ideas out there, this is my innovation. <laughs> There's <laughs> yeah. There's have you got have you got your have you got your fingers on answers for what's next, or are you, are you laying yeah. in questions? No, I don't. It's just I an don't. endless unfolding of questions. But yeah, but here's the question: How you ask it in my mind? Because it's, it's the dual nature of everything. So 
good and evil, um, religion or, or creation, big bang, you know, um, God, the devil, everything's got a dual nature. If you really think about it, um, even in, like I just talked about painting, it's representation or expression. You either represent Jordan by painting him or you express what he, what it feels like to be Jordan or whatever. Right. So we've got this dual nature and you think the answer is to like science, religion, a dual nature is one or the other. So you think that the, the answer is to compromise and take the best features of both. Right. Mm. And I, but I'm thinking, no, that isn't the way in all of these dual questions, like free will or determinism, right? Like when you say you're going to move to Bali, did that, is that determined by fate? Because, you know, you know, Big Bang came along and molecules went like this. And the molecule that made your chemical brain right now is it's, it's not possible for you to decide anything but Bali or, or God preordained it, right? So that's determinism or free will is I get to choose and it doesn't matter what happened in the past, right? So there's a dual nature there too. But instead of trying to combine these two to come up with, with a compromise or a blended thing, the answer is to come up with a third way that isn't a blend. And I don't know what that looks like. So these dual nature things, what's the third, what's the third way of looking at what's the third, for instance, and I, I, and I'm not sure how to, for instance, um, let's say you take something like, the beginning of the universe. It's either a prime mover like God or whatever created it, uh, it had to start, right? Or the second thing is the Big Bang started it. So it's, but it still had to start. So if you think it's, if it's one, gotta be this one or the other, it's either gotta be, it either has to have a prime mover or not, but it started, right? That's the two, there's the two options only there is. Something started it or something didn't start it, but it still started. Hmm. So what's the third thing? The compromise would be while well, a prime mover, but he just left it to go. But what if there's a third way? Then I don't know what it is, you know? Like, what if there's a, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, so, so is this the cutting edge of your, your, where your mind is when you're laying on the bed? Yeah, yeah, it's one thing I was thinking about recently. Because, you know, I wrote in my book that all, like, we, we have this concept that, that, um, I, I can't have that girl that I saw walking on the street, even though I covered her and I would really like to be with a girl like that. She's totally my type of girl. I can't have her because I got this wife and kids. Right. And so I wrote, I wrote this whole essay about this where a man goes, well, it's easy for you to say to choose what you want. I can't because I want, I would choose her, but I can't because they got this. And then my answer to that is, is if you're saying you want this girl, but you can't because you have the, can't have the kids you you basically have an obligation which is an anchor okay mm. so when you go back to the wife and kids you look at them with bad eyes you're thinking you know i'm stuck with you so your heart's not there your heart's with the woman walking down the street that you saw but if on the other hand if you choose the woman and and leave the wife and kids for the woman then uh then the wife and kids are sad and you lost something you feel sad because you lost something so you think oh, I can't, I'm stuck between two bad choices, you know, and instead you think you're, you're between two good choices and the two good choices, I think everything, every decision, everything fork in your life or everything can be come down to two things. There's two things that you want, not two things you're stuck with or have to do. You don't have to say, I have to have the, I have to do this because I got married to this woman, right? Yeah. You say, I choose what a, gr a good choice in life is for me to have my wife and children and to consciously choose them. And, and, to, and to move forward with them in good grace, right? I chose it. Hmm. And a second mm -hmm. beautiful option, which take morality, religion out of it, whatever, is me and that woman together would be a fantastic, beautiful thing. That's two, those are two positives now. You take all those things and make positives out of them on one hand or the other. That's a positive, that's a positive, right? And all you have to decide then is by looking at the two positives, which one you would rather choose in a positive way as opposed to I'm stuck with it, right? And then you're consciously choosing. So it doesn't matter if you choose the woman, 
because you consciously chose her. You consciously chose that, you know, and it doesn't matter if you choose the wife and kids. Yeah. So, uh, so everything, so that's a dual nature. So the third, th the third thing that I'm talking about, you're not doing a compromise. The third thing is you're, ch you're, you're shifting the way you look at it into two positives and then choosing one that would make your heart feel better in life. Recognize I'm going to be sad because of this, but I still choose this. Something like that. Right. It's the third way. Right. And that third way is a, a much more intelligent conversation. Because rather than yeah, nagging, at, nagging, at, nagging at the compromise between the two of them, then you get to answer, like, what is it about that single woman walking down the street, which is so, gives me so yeah. much? And, and what facet of that can I take home and put in my existing relationship? Like, right. what was it? You know, what is missing at home so that I look for that and pine for that? And what creativity can I use? Like something about her walk yeah. or her dress or how can I find a way to see my wife like that? The, yeah. You start so asking questions is, is like now, that. It's a, now you make it, now you're having a mindful way of going through life. You mindfully said, you know what? I would really like to be with that woman, but I don't want to lose the security and, and fun with my wife and kids. And I want to continue to nurture that. That's a conscious choice for your wife and kids. Now, when you walk in the door, you're not, I'm stuck with these people and angry and frustrated and taking it out on them. You walk in with a, with a notion that I've consciously chosen you. Yeah, I had something great out there, but I chose you. And they can feel that energy, right? So, or, or vice versa, the other way around. And so, and so it becomes a, a net positive in some way. But it's a third way of looking at it as opposed to, I, I can't have that because I got to do this. I can't go, I can't, it's like say, I can't live in Thailand because of the, the things. So I got to go to Bali or you, you know what I mean, right? It's like, it's like there's two beautiful choices and what's, you know, do I want to, do I want to try and maintain this or I want to do that? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't explored this fully, but I, I think a lot. <laughs> the, all, I think all these paradoxes come together in the, in the next stage, whatever that will be. Yeah. With the, with the commitment thing, um, freedom and commitment, they seem like two opposite sides of the coin, but there's actually okay, there tremendous, go, one, yeah. there's tremendous freedom in commitment. Because as soon as you realize, wow, I've chosen fully to commit to my girl, um, then the temptation to look at another girl is just a temptation. It's not going to get acted yeah. upon. And within that, you stop chasing around dozens and dozens of women <laughs> look, looking for the right one or looking for kicks or looking for validation or whatever it might be. And then you've got one and it's like, wow, look how much energy I've now saved that I can put into some other pursuit. Exactly. It, it, so it, it's going to change. Something culturally is going to change. And, you know, it may be that Western society, you know, that started with Rome and, and Greece has run its course. I don't know. And maybe That's 100 what I'm years reading. from now, it's, it's going to be the Eastern philosophies that are going to, you know, like China and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, and they could dominate as civilization. So then what do, you, what do you go forth with, for instance, what kind of work could we create that you, you translate the Chinese and the Chinese go, this is glorious. Well, it's, it's an interesting time, you know, we're recording this, we're about to make this promo series for the masculinity for the 2020s. Talking about where Aza Murata stands in all of this and men today, like where do we stand? And I've taken this moment in time to just the last couple of months to really step back and read a bit more broadly about what's really going on. Because I, right. I grew up, I grew up in the eighties, nineties, two thousands. That's when my kind of mindset was formed by what is current in the world, and it's liberal democracy, late capitalism. Right? Yeah. I, I yeah. can follow my dreams, go anywhere I want. Everyone's got equal vote, equal rights, and um, it's basically a party. <laughs> you know, go and do what you want, and as long as you're making enough money, like no one gives in a shit. West. Just try, try and not harm anyone else. And it feels like from I mean, if we're on the cutting edge of the next phase and we don't know what's going to come next in all these different pursuits, um, some things that are on the horizon are there's a chance that our political system, liberal democracy, is on, is on the wane. A lot of our countries are actually bankrupt. Yeah. A lot of other countries are actually rising. A lot of countries from the States to the UK, different factions in parts of Europe, Russia, China particularly, are very much more nationalistic than before. Yes. Um, people are, I think, seeing through some of the liberalism 
especially some of the culture wars that we've got at the moment. Like oh, yeah. this, yeah. this facet of this tribe of people at war with this tribe of people within the United States, within the same town, ideologically, it's come out of yeah. this very liberal um, model. And now that's, you know, what happened to our mysticism and what happened to the grandeur of our country and what happened to being yeah. British, you know, that was all getting, that was all getting slung out you know, yeah. going bit by bit into Europe, which is a very progressive thing, but at the same time, people are wondering about their identity and how things are changing so fast. And it's who, who are we right now? From internal, and I tell you, it is really in danger. That idea of like, what does it mean to be British? You know, yeah, that is on. It's I don't know how to save it. I don't know if you can save it. There's a book, uh, yeah. the the strange death of Europe. don't need to say too much about it, but you can imagine the way that the, the very old identities and ways of being and um, uh, culture that's been very loved is just being yeah. given up by, by generations of people that aren't actually very willing to fight for anything that came before. It's like, why would I, why would I fight for yeah. that old that's stuff? That's the whole idea of conservatism is to conserve institutions, conserve literature, conserve music that was handed down that had meaning, you know, that created the, for instance, the British soul or the Canadian yeah. identity and hand that down. That's the, that's the idea of culture. And yeah. the liberal mind is, is to deconstruct culture and say, you know, no. And that's what globalism too is like the, to erase borders, erase languages, and you erase this, you know? So, but for better or worse, that's what we're, we're hitched to, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Unless, unless some radical, carving off of some continent comes along and some new America comes along and some conservative right wing energy is going to say, okay, listen, we're going to take over Vietnam and make it the Haven. And you know, it, it is our own, it's our own, uh, political, I don't know, because it's, uh, it's all, it's all kind of melting in, internally. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, so I think perhaps this next generation of music, art literature is going to be maybe perhaps it has to be deeply embodied because the last 20 30 40 50 years has all been totally cerebral how can i play yeah. a trick on the conceptual world of art by putting really clever ideas together and then shoving it in a gallery advertising yeah so it's so it's art without soul art without body and i think 2020s is going to be a big decade for embodiment people are like look how um pathetic my span of attention has become with the conditioning of screens right the, the the art of philosophy very few people can actually do that think yeah. coherently argue coherently follow some debate through to a logical conclusion because the yeah. the the muscles of the mind are down to 10 15 seconds in a lot of people as well yeah. so so i think there's going to be a movement to embodiment a movement towards spirit um we've got these things like i don't know what apps and bionic chips and and virtual reality is going to do but it's like what if we start what if some rich very progressive segment of society starts putting a, a chip inside them that can put their brains into a deep state of meditation and just download all information <laughs> so so it's like on, on the one hand you've got the ones going for the soul and you've got other people that are going for how can i make myself this bionic man what does that mean for art? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and artificial intelligence and you know this kind of stuff. And it's it's really what is like cooking and 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 the things that we would like have checks and balances on and really consider in the West, they don't have in the East. So would they make a? Uh, I shouldn't say that you know flippantly, but would China have the same reservation on creating? putting chips inside citizens, for instance, than we do. I don't know. There's a different culture there and there's a different, and, and maybe they're right. And we're the ones that are backwards. If that's the case, you know, I, you just don't know. Yeah. So who knows? So we, it's not like we can say, let's, let's have some research and study, for instance, genetically modifying babies, right? Let's consider this and let's do it wisely. And, and what's the ethics of it? When another country is just doing it, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden they're ahead of it. They're, Skips the whole they're debate. Science ahead of ours because they because they're just doing it. Yeah, they're not yeah. studying it or thinking of the implications. 
that is doing it. So you get left behind. Your culture gets left behind because you're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And then we don't really know about the climate and what's going on. And even our sources of information are highly dubious. Yep. What, what can we actually believe about anything that's going on in the planet? Um, well, how, so what happens then with what we're trying to create? Because I really do believe you are right that it ha- it's gonna, it, there's going to be a shifting and a returning, returning or a changing, going back to the idea of spirit. Because nobody... I have this idea, you know, like the idea of free zone, you know, like, which is goosebumps. When you see, when you see a, a painting that, that catches your heart, or you listen to a piece of music and you get shivers, you know, or you look at, you know, the face of a loved one, and she's smiling at you and, and you have that butterfly feeling here. That's something that science has not explained. They cannot describe that. That to me is connection, direct connection to that otherworldly, transcendent sense of divine right which scientists say ah, that's not true it's just a bunch of chemicals flashing um and i th- but i think that that is the future that's the future of ours amrata is like how do it how do we maximize that those experiences for ourselves and for others that come into contact with us so in other words if I said, I'm going, to sit, I'm going to write a piece of music that's going to give Jordan goosebumps. You don't know that, right? You don't know what Jordan gets goosebumps on, right? So, so if I set out to, I'm going to write a piece of music that's going to give shivers down the spine of people, right? What would that look like? Death metal, you know, symphony, you don't know. So all you can do as an artist or creator is sit there and think, what would give me yeah. goosebumps? Yeah. And write something that you would like to hear, write a piece of a sentence in the, in the literature that you would, that would make you cry. Yeah. Cause yeah. you can't, you, you can't assume what's going to make it for others. So, and that's what we're missing in modern art. We're missing like right now it's just shock and look at me, the artist, there's no attempt to have someone or, or to make yourself tear up or think yeah, I'm, it's going to be okay Yeah. in art. Yeah. So that's where, that's the future of where we have to go. It has to have that transmissive quality. Like if it breaks your heart open as you write it, then it's going to, and I stumbled onto this myself. I wrote a few posts where I got right to the end and I'm like, if I actually press post on this, it's going to be nuts because I don't know if I'm slightly a psychopath, but my, my heart bled as I was writing this. And I knew that there was something there, right? It vibrates. It's yeah. like, holy shit, like I stumbled onto something here. And, and kind of without fail, every time I'd press post, the right ones in a private message cannot yeah. believe you just wrote that. I need to read that like 50 it's, times. It's right, Jordan, I promise you. That idea of creating art and creating a consciousness and a philosophy that is geared towards only that, what makes your heart stop, which is beauty which is what, what is the beauty in, in a passage or in a woman's face or in, in, in breaking bread with your brothers? What that is what's we're missing on earth. We're starving for That's That's why you get those comments. So the yeah. future of ours and rod, as far as I'm concerned is the reclamation of that, you know, and it's, if there was going to be like, we had modernism, postmodernism, um, absurdism, existentialism, all these different isms. If there's going to be a new ism, then, you know, something like Friesenism, which is the French word for exactly that feeling of, of just feeling that, that shudder, that, that peak experience is Maslow's energetic feeling of that it's, that it's going to be okay. And that, you know, and you're connecting to something beyond yourself. Yeah. I, so I got, I got, is, is the future. I've got a question on that, but before going there, I heard a very beautiful philosophical rambling about um, algorithms and how like just how you can be monitored so you're asking the question like how can i actually compose the piece of music that makes jordan's hair stand up on end and me come out in goosebumps well you know you look on youtube or you look on amazon and they know exactly what is your taste in music and if and if you click on my mix you've got 50 songs 25 you've heard before but the other 25 it recommends to you so the, the deeper That's the algorithm, algorithm penetrates into the body, it could actually measure the hormonal secretion that goes on. Right. 
and, and what is actually happening on a nervous system level, on a hormonal level in the body as I listen to music. And it could try and compose pieces of music which are absolutely apt to what floats my boat, depending on what mood I want to feel. Yeah, so if it took a hundred songs that you labeled personally, as that really makes me think, you know, think about my life and whatever, and, and makes me pause and makes me tear up a bit. It can take those hundred songs and take elements from it. That would be interesting. It can make up music on the fly uh, with all the elements that touch that one particular person because it's measuring it like you know that ring that you've got you could actually yeah. wear a ring and that ring would know when you're getting off to music or when you're actually a bit bored right there's, there's vibrations yeah. and pulses it can pick up in your finger and compose some music on the fly for you that's going to make you feel a certain way based on all the music that you ever listened to before which got measured by the system okay so, then so, here's my <laughs> go ahead so we might end up in a situation where we're having a race for art or a race for transcendent which is the the man made listen, I'm yeah. going to kind of download this straight from the, the divine and then put it, onto, put it into music, play it on piano. And then you've got the Amazon algorithm, <laughs> which is, yeah. it's, it's got all the information that it ever took from your body and, and your brain waves. And that's composing transcendence for you as well. Except that, is that artificial? And, and by that I mean, does it give you the emotional impact? Right? It gets hair, hair stand up in the back of your neck. But does it give you the sense of destiny, legacy, feeling you're part of something, civilization? You know what I mean? Does, is there meaning in it? Because it it's meaningless, really, if they just came up with this, this, this song that was created on the fly. Yeah. It doesn't have intent behind it, I guess you could say. Can, so one question is how deeply can they decode and encode meaning? Like that algorithm can make yeah. it so granular, like it almost gets there. And then is there a, a hum, is there a perception, a human perception, if we switch it on, which goes beyond all of that, like that can tell. Because a lot of people will be fooled by it. You know, a lot of people are listening to Katy Perry all around the world, totally fooled by the fact that it's shit music. So the difference is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the difference is, what AI may not be able to ever produce is meaning. It can give you emotional impact, but can AI ever give meaning, which means the sense that, you know, my ancestors came from, and I can feel that in my book, you know what I mean? That's interesting. Scary inquiry. The, the other thing I wanted to bring up, like that's one rabbit hole. We've got about a billion we could go down. But, but this thing about transcendence, you're talking about frisson is your word? Yeah. Uh, frisson for the goosebumps feeling. Yeah. So go, going for that goosebumps feeling, is that a luxury of the post postmodern man? Um, is, is there kind of like an upper class of semi-retired nomadic artist types who have automated income and just can look for transcendence? Because there are, right? You know, a lot of people traveling the world looking for those experiences, ayahuasca and all the rest of it, um, automatic. Um, they've, they've got their income and their lifestyle designed to a certain level that they can go around and search for transcendence. Is that going to be a luxury or is it a necessity? Well, that's the thing. Like, like see, my, so my, my presumption is that everybody, no matter the culture, no matter the religion background, whether atheist or not, they all have this longing for beauty, right? They all have the longing for that peak experience of that, that transcendent feeling. Um, they want to be loved and belong in, in a group, for instance, and be included in a group in every culture, in, in all of history. So uh, um, I'm, 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 So I, I don't know, like I think that anything you do fo going forward, anything you write going forward, any YouTube video you, you do going forward should have in mind, am I creating that for myself? Is that something that would make me have an impact on me? You know, because you don't know, maybe would it have impact on people in Nairobi, your, your videos who are, you know, like scraping in the dirt and 
poor maybe for instance right or um w i don't know but there's something that's common denominator for all of humanity which is this feeling of i want to be warm i want to be fed i want you know I, that there's basic needs and then i want to have companionship i want to sit in fellowship you know i want to to feel like i'm i'm have validated from from peers sort of thing um and then i want to live in in where other people are that's why there's there's towns and cities in every culture of the world i don't care how poor they are they live in groups because hmm. there's a real need you know so so there's a common denominator underneath all of this and we have the luxury of art and and we and, and digital nomad nomads because we're we've taken care of things that are basic necessities we don't have to worry about where's our food going to come from yeah you know yeah. So we can, we can, we can be idle. We can do, we can, we can go out, we can, we can put graffiti all over buildings because we don't have to worry about, you know, going to hunt a deer. So we spray graffiti. We can do that. We can go out and protest with vagina hats on our head because of Western society has given us the ability to do that, you know? And, you know, and, and, you know, the terrorists are out there saying, no, it's wrong, it's wrong. And they're blowing up, uh, they're, they're setting up their bombs with iPhones. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they want the technology too, right? Right? They're 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 just as locked into the technology as we are, right? So there's a common denominator of human need, which isn't food and stuff. It's it's and it's what I think is like that longing for beauty, whatever culture you're in. Now I can't say that that Beethoven is the greatest. Like you'll have the the you know the the quote unquote Western world saying that Beethoven is one of the pinnacles of humanity or Mozart, right? And you will have people in your town in England say that in my town in Canada say, yeah, that's just, it's like, you can't compare Katy Perry to that. But you look at other cultures like in Romania, mm. there's the, the villages in Romania and the, the kind of the gypsy energy there. They would listen to Beethoven and go, huh? Huh? They don't get it. They don't feel it. They don't just make, doesn't give them a sense of free song, you know? So, but they listen to that Manole music, which is little, 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 and they listen to it day and night and they love it. And yeah. it makes them smile. So do they get this? So would they not say that that's the pinnacle of music, you know? So, so you can't just impose a culture on other cultures and say, this is what, this is the pinnacle and we're going to teach you. Like they did, you know, the Jesuits went out and said, this is the pinnacle of, you know, society. We train you, teach you English because that's the best language. Yeah. But yeah. there is a, but below that level, there's a longing for beauty. So the beauty in Manole for that tribe for, or for those villages is no different than the, than the somebody crying up because they listened to a, you know, Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. It's no different. There's that element underneath it. And that's beauty. So, I don't know. I got to... It's tough, man. Crazy, huh? I wanted to ask you, um, your mentor, Sir Roger Scruton, passed away a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Yeah. How's, um, and this is someone you sought out and visited a couple of times in England and wanted to do a bit of work with and introduce Amirati to, because he had yeah. a lot of well fleshed out thoughts on, on these topics um how how's that landing with you and is that affecting your thoughts and aspiration well, it's changed in your work something. yeah it's changed something like i was going to work with them right as you know we, we had plans and we were going to you know put our energies together obviously like in the you know going to him as opposed to us together <laughs> you know what i mean i wouldn't presume that i have any kind of a body of work or or sense of of experience and stuff that he does so i was going to go with a group of people on mm. pilgrimage to him yeah and in, increase us all in that way but it, it was the plans were in place man we were gonna we had it all planned we had a bunch of interest we had we were we were working out the details of who's going to stay in what room it was on that level and he was excited and then he died and and so that's just kind of, I was talking to his, 
this personal assistant who works with him every single day on the morning that he died. I was talking to her, making plans about where the people are going to stay and, you know, who's, who, how do we get the money transferred and this kind of stuff from the people. And a couple hours later, I found out he's dead. So, and so it, the whole thing is kind of on hold. However, my immediate impact to it was, all right, we got to take over some way. Yeah. We got to take it over because there's nobody doing it. There's nobody having this kind of conversation, you know? And so we can't stop. We just got to keep, we got to keep going, but now it's, it's incumbent upon us to do it with our limited knowledge and our limited uh, ability, but at least we got to do it. You know, we don't have the, this, maybe the, the depth of the thinking and certainly not the education of someone like Roger and not the connections and not the respectability from countries. You know, he, the last thing that happened to him a week before he died was the Hungarian government, the president of Hungary gave him the, the, the Hungarian medal of freedom for, you know, what he did in the, in the Eastern Bloc during communism. Right. Yeah. And he's been yeah. honored by Czech Republic and all this kind of stuff. So he, I mean, I don't have, we have never done anything like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to insert this, like for anyone watching, um, I read stories about how Sir Roger would, um, uh, penetrate communist borders with books and where they were burning books from academics, he would actually bring a load of wheel, you know, trucks and wheelbarrows of books from academics of the West back in so they could have yeah. a, an internal cultural renaissance like within, um, behind the Iron Curtain. This is in the... And he smuggled the cash in. He smuggled cash. Right. Into Poland and a place like that. And he was roughed up by the secret police a few times. So he, he, he put his, you know, his money where his mouth is sort of thing. Um, and we've never done anything like that. You or me, we've sat at Bali and, <laughs> and, 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 and complained to, you know, about little random things, you know? Uh, well, so, well, we've tried to smuggle ourselves into certain countries with no cash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that compares. So, but we've got to take over somehow. I honestly think so. So this whole idea of what we've been doing in the past, which is the basis of what we've been doing, but it's got to shift into something else. Yeah. So, so like breaking this down a little bit, I know we don't have concrete answers at this point, but Azamarata was, I mean, it was never solely about women and attraction and dating and seduction, even though uh, yeah. most people came to us because of those topics. Yeah. I think m everyone really recognized that there was always something more that this was aspiring to and pointing to. Right. That's but right. In, Arza Murata 1.0, let's say it was, and it has been, and it is primarily a, a training. Like this is how yeah. you can maximize the beauty in your relationship to women. And this is how you can maximize your, the beauty you're experiencing in your life as an individual man. And, and yeah, I think like it, a Jordan, I, I, Peterson, Jordan Peterson thing, which is get yourself in order, make your room, you know, make us get yourself, fix yourself, get yourself ready to go. It's kind yeah. of like that. That's the one point of it. But, and I think there was something very individualistic about it. Design your life, have an adventure that isn't her. Yeah. Yes. There, there's a graciousness and a generosity because it's not just about filling your cup from the women that you meet or the people that you meet and the experiences that you have, but there's a generosity and a giving as well. But it feels like the Aza Murata 2.0, which just to put a challenge out there, a word out there maybe to grow into, but, but there's something much more about what is needed for, for us as communities, societies, countries, um, an online and real life tribe of people that don't really find yeah. their philosophy fitting into any of the other big tribes, which are loud and all at war with each other in, at the moment. That there's something new right. that's brewing, which women, of course, have to be a massive part of that. But it's um, this substrata of beauty, which you talk about. There is something, the fire, the torch passed on from Roger, Roger Scruton, um, onto you, onto your tribe, onto us. There's yeah, something the, being called forth. And the key is if we try and go if we say, okay, let's go and fix society or give some medicine to society, who are we? You know, all we can do 
in other words, that intent to go out there and, and, and make some kind of cultural creative change I, I might be sincere, but I think it's misguided. I think all we can do is create a body of work by the time we're dead that would make us pause and make us cry personally for myself. And that will have the greatest impact we can do out there, you know? Instead of trying to be earnestly trying to, okay, I want, J Jordan, I really want you to get this message. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I've so created this so you understand, in your language, you understand it. You create something that you understand personally, the Jordans of the world will say, that's it. Yeah. And, and there'll be people within our ranks that are like, yeah, let's turn around and do this. We've got an agenda and we must restore beauty. Yeah. You know, another faction of the social justice warrior, the right. beauty justice warrior that turns back into society, <laughs> fights it out in the culture wars, proves to everyone how we're right without listening to anyone else's perspective on it, which is just what everybody else is doing. But you're talking yeah. about a, a, a quietly turning away, um, not in complete... Um, defeat or rejection of what's going no, on but not at all let's walk a path a, a personal embodied soul focused yeah. path where you know if, if we can break ourselves open and cry on our deathbed because we were fully given with our gifts in life yeah then that's got to that's our best that's chance of resonating this culture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because we, we can't we can't produce yeah. we can't produce works that um, are going to resonate with a lot of people. Manufacture the marketing. Um, yeah, that's trying to guess what's going to have an impact, and you can't do that because you can just create stuff, create an energy, and you know, and it's a solitary thing, you know, like it's it's, but it's also in collaboration. It's in you know, the greatest things Steinbeck wrote in East of Eden, he said, there's nothing ever been be created by a multitude ever that has any value created by a multitude. It's a, it's a solitary mind that, and then the solitary mind goes to collaboration with another solitary mind. And then, you know, and, and then it expands from there. And um, there's some truth to that. So I really do think that if we go out there and try and man, we're going to do this incredible change work <laughs> you know it's 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 the intention is there but it but it becomes this earnestness which is not good and i don't know why why i think that but mm -hmm. it feels like we have to do something that's going to change us on an individual level personally like what sermon would you want to hear is what you need to start to preach what what's something that you want to hear for yourself yeah. That's the only thing you know. You can't go to these people in, in the villages of, of small Romania and say, uh, you know, Beethoven is, is way better than your music. That's what's been, you know, that's colonialism and imperialism has done for, you know, for centuries. They may be right. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but that, it's that sledgehammer try, you know, I'm going to show you with the, the correct, the, the, you know, you're a you're a, a small villager you're primitive and i'll show you culture yeah so we can't impose culture we've got to only create culture that has something to us personally that makes sense to me so when i'm dead i can say man i sh I've, i listened to that music that i wrote myself or I, I read that piece i wrote myself that was for me and that will change everything that i think that'd be a huge impact jordan that's my thinking so this is the question of legacy that we're talking about, the topic yeah. of legacy. And it's yeah. like, a, like an artist's path or a seeker's path. Yeah. To find but out you better what, believe it's what real. that is. You better believe it's real and you better believe it's, a, it's, some, it's, a, it's about to happen. I don't know what it looks like, for sure. I'm trying to write this book. That's why I'm here in Florence. I'm trying to write this book. And I spend a lot of time just staring at the wall and thinking a lot. And I pick away at the words and stuff. Yeah. Um, and the stuff I've written, I like. At the same time, I'm like, can I say it? Oh, in, in, can I say it? I don't know. I don't know. Are we on the topics of your book on this on this conversation? 
Is this the kind yeah. of stuff that the reader can expect? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to write about this type of thing, you know, without, without giving answers, of course. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to write about this. Yeah. What is that? What is that meaning of basically I'm trying to write about the transcendent, you know, what is it? What is the call to something beyond, which is the call to art? You know, when you look at, when you look at it, I was, I was just in the Uffizi gallery here. I, I took one day off and I went to the Uffizi gallery where Botticelli's, you know, birth of Venus and all these different things. Wow. And da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and uh, Caravaggio and stuff. And, and I went and, I, and there's nobody there because it's winter here. Mm. So I was like standing with Botticelli's uh, in, the, in the room with Botticelli's um, birth of Venus, which is one of the most famous paintings in the world. And I'm by myself. Hey. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Staying there and ha have the room to yourself sort of thing. And it's like, um, um, yeah. So, I mean, like, did you get a free song? Yeah, you do, you know? And, and so, so, I mean, you know, Maslow talked about the hierarchy of needs, right? In 1960, whatever it was, 1965. Yeah. But what people don't know is that he talked about, you know, here's your basic needs, which is food and water and shelter and warmth. Next needs is companionship and, and, you know, validation and inclusion. And then the next need level is fulfillment or, you know, esteem belonging. Right. Yeah. And then the last very one is self actualization, which is, which we would call, you know, self help and become more excellent and, you know, all become, yeah. Fulfill your potential, become who you can be. Yeah. Yeah. The, the maximum you can be, but what people don't realize that, not only did he create that thing, but he said the entire goal of life is to maximize those peak experiences. He, That's the only reason he, he said that the, your only, the only reason or, or, or the, the goal of life is to, is to, is to create as many peak experiences as you can. In other words, make it a, a conscious thing that you're trying to do. He slapped on um, an extra, layer at the top of that pyramid in the last few years before his death and oh, yeah? the business schools oh, yeah, they, I heard it. Yeah. yeah the business schools where they teach the hierarchy of needs they don't have this it stops at self-actualization so it's basically if, right? yeah so if you follow up to the top of self-actualization all you are is a very actualized competent individual yeah. kind of ego the typical yeah. ceo boss who's successful in the things that he's striven for throughout his entire life but then there's a glass ceiling because if there is no yeah. peak experience or if there's no window that goes into the self-transcendence which is the, the the final peak that he put on his pyramid uh, there's a dryness to that it's like right. that that typical thing of uh, and you've worked with tons of men like this in in your cars yeah, that all? Is that all? I, is I have saying? everything but my 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 hairs on my body are not tingling you know my goosebumps are not tingling i'm not dating that girl and then running home at the end of it, clicking my feet together three times because it was so beautiful. It, it took me beyond the yeah, scope of exactly. my best potential. So that's where it's got to go. That's, that's yeah. the level we're talking about, Jordan. And, and that's all I think about. And how to tap into it and how to, what does that look like if we were to write about it or, or make music about it or, you know, that's all I think. 2.0 and the new book coming soon sure. just beating me up but i'm working on it this this was a random catch-up with with the two of us right we're, we're about to record some other videos um <laughs> and, and we got way late but if if you like the philosophy of this i'd love to hear your comments below because we'll stick this out somewhere youtube facebook or the rest yeah, of it we should make this the video series because this is what this we one? wanted this this is the kind of the people we want in, in essentials that are having this, that have, I mean, we said here a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, but it's what we want to go to. Right. Yeah. This is what I, this is the kind of guys I want, you know, we talk about our Amirati ritual in our list. One of the things I have in my list that I want to manifest for myself is I want to sit in the company of, philosophers that's what i want you know how i don't know 
but I want to sit in, in the energy of people who are having the same conversation, uh, interested in this conversation. And um, so this is the kind of people we want to draw into our, into the Amirati. And that's the conversation I want to have on the Amirati is, it, you know, we had a lot of low level questions on ours Amirati Facebook group uh, about masturbation. So that's not a conversation, you know, it might be a valid conversation and guys have legitimate questions, but it's not, it's not something on, on what we're trying to understand. I don't think so. Anyway, so one, idea. one topic that for me, I, I know you have a lot of, um, resistance against the notion of self-help and the personal development industry. Not all of it. Yeah you know, don't want to tire it all with the same brush by any stretch of the imagination. And there's a lot of stuff in there that's useful for a lot of different moments and needs, but there's something about, uh, the compulsion of self-help and that personal development cycle that a lot of us find themselves in. A lot of our members find themselves in as they find our message that I know that is antithetical to what you believe. Yeah. And I don't know why, but it just, there's something in it. It is, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's new, right? It's new. Like, I mean, if you look at Virginia Woolf and some of these writers in the twenties and thirties, they were reading books on how to be a better writer and how to be better excellence. So, so self-help's like 120 years old or, you know, over hundred years old, but it feels like it's the number one genre of book out there right now is self-help, which blows my mind. The next thing is memoir. Right. which is Jordan writes his life story at 38 years old, whatever age you are, writes his life story and the things he's learned and, and stuff like that. And everybody's doing it. They're teaching that in literature classes. Their, their assignment is to write your memoir. If you're 23 years old, write mem your memoir. Wow. Which is all about, which is all about, me which <laughs> is complete, Instagram. Nar complete narcissism so the first one is how can i be better and get yeah. the things i want more and more in life and yeah. the second one is how can i tell my story more effectively exactly. to position myself and all the so rest two of things that, that i naturally have a revulsion for which is self-help yeah. and memoir <laughs> it just blows my mind because yeah it's all about me and yeah it blows my mind and 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 that's all there is. That's the number one and number two genre of books that are being sold. You go into any bookstore and it's self-help, business help, for instance, right? Or, or any of this kind of stuff. Um, and or the memoir of me and, you know, what happened with me. And my, my father was a, was a drunk and my mother beat me up, you know, which happened to all of us. And yet it's become this thing, you know, it's like weird. Hmm. And that's the state of our culture. That's the state of our culture. Look at me, 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 me. You know, even like I said, like art has shifted into the artist. The artist, uh, you know, the Tate, Tate uh, Museum in London shows Tracy Emmons' bed, which is her unmade bed. My bed's right there and it's not made. And she took her entire bed with the vodka bottles beside it, used condoms and stuck it in, in the, in the, Museum, the museum bought it for a couple million pounds per bed, you know, and it's, it's what is, goes for art nowadays because it's about the artist. This is me. And the other thing she did was all the men I've slept with and she put the names of all the men she slept with in this kind of a tent thing and just their names. And that was sold for, you know, that it's, it's, it's about all about her. The artist has become the supreme thing as opposed to what she's trying to create. And she's not alone. And so the whole, this, and Instagram, everything is shifted into look at me and everybody's a blogger. Everybody's writing on medium.com, you know? Yeah. There's so much out there. Everybody can, can now, and I'm not saying there's, there's, it's a lot of bad stuff. Well, there is a lot of bad stuff, <laughs> but the, the whole point is this entire culture of us in our Western society can be summed up as, Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. My rights. I look at my, what about my rights as opposed to my duty to my community? I, and my identity politics, yeah. Identity politics. It's all about the individual and me. 
and I'm thinking, you, you know, so, so, so on the, on that end of the spectrum, I'm just kind of quick on that end of the spectrum, you got the identity politics. I was, you know, I'm from a group of victims. So I'm going to stand up and can, you know, claim my right. peace here and, and get just vengeance for the anger that I feel vengeance. because of my group and my, my persuasion and my beliefs and so on. But then on the other end of the spe spectrum, you've got lifestyle porn, like this, this influencer industry. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm fucking pornographic, <laughs> which is what Instagram is, right? Like my self image right. is better than the, the other self images out there. So follow it basically. After I've taken and 200 photos and taken one of those <laughs> and then doctored it for four hours. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. I still feel like it, like I didn't get enough likes on it. And and the yeah. problem with that is um, all this focus on me, 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 me. The the classic art, like the what you were talking about, going to see Botticelli and these these moments where you can really get an um, frisson or, or impact or something shifts your consciousness. Like in yeah. in my kind of, um, I I did a retreat last year which was uh, about meditation and art basically, and we studied the, um, that Botticelli painting you were talking about. Um, it, it's laden with mystical references and occult uh -huh. symbols and so on. And if you look at it the right way, the idea is that it changes your consciousness. You go into the painting and if you spend a good five, 10 minutes with it, it will do subtle things to you. And that was the intent of the artist. Can you perceive that as a viewer? Well, that's down to a training or a perception. Yeah. It takes exactly. a lot of training to understand fine art as well as create it, right? So it's a language that, that you can grow into and learn. But I think these works that stand the test of time, are, rather than look at me, 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 it's look at us, 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 or look at that, that, that. Exactly. Look at that. Monticelli was not about himself. He wanted to be famous and he wanted to bang all the girls in Florence and, you know, like, of course, right? Yeah. So he was trying to be like better than all the other guys on his personal level, but his art was about, look, his representation, you know, and they can, or lack of a better word, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what's the symbolism I can put into here? And and the same in dating, not look at me, 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 but look at you, 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 not your self image, but who you really are, what motivates you, who are you really? And look at that, look at that, 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 which we can experience together. Yeah, like, you know, like, here's the girl, here's you. The relationship is here. It's the third thing. I wrote about that in Alabaster Girl, you know? And it's like, and even, even in the conversation, you're, you're looking out here to the horizon, what's possible? That's creating a, that's creating a vista, you know? Mm. And it's what we're missing. It's all about me, 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 me. Incredible. Someone Incredible. asked a little while ago in the Azamarata group, what is... Um... What is a uh, new self-help book that's really useful? Yeah. And uh, my instant reaction was read literature. Yeah, that's for sure. And I think what's pernicious about the self-help cycle that we get on is that as we're busy helping ourselves, we're stuck in a cycle looking at ourselves. We don't actually get learn correct. how to see. We don't that's learn how correct. to see at all because we're trying to perfect that mechanism or get get that image that we can display to the world. And, and yeah. the gift in all of this is, is to be able to see it. Um, I was, no, that's correct, Jordan. Absolutely correct. So yeah, there, there's nothing, if you read, um, what's that great book, The Un Unbearable Lightness of Being, you will learn more about relationship yeah. psychology in those 300 odd pages than you will in 20 relationship psychology because it's visceral. And you can see that the complexes and the, how, the, how these men and women are like slightly fucked up, but they're staying in relationship with each other and they have all these dynamics and one goes to the war-torn country, one sneaks across the border. And it's yeah. just like these motifs. I've heard Sir Roger yeah. Scruton talk about this as well. There's motifs about our relationship life. There was something in the background on the day we met, which resurfaced two years later when we had the argument on the hill. And then five years later, we meet again in the original city and the same motif that was running all the way through, it comes back. It's like a classical piece of music. Right. And, and there's something about, I mean, I, I remember listening to your stories of the early women that you met when you were a teenager or in your early twenties. 
that you would meet some kind of hippie or mystic um, traveling girl who oh, would I remember. totally, yeah, reading Herman Hesse and all these people that would just <laughs> turn your mind upside down with their view on life. That, and, and I think most of us have an experience of a woman who's done this. We, we, we're kind of living in a certain box. You know, as, as we get older, hopefully the box that we live in is getting bigger and bigger. But then a woman comes in at some point and it's just like, you're seeing everything through a box and what you're missing is all of this. And if we're lucky, we meet a woman who shows us life outside of our, the, the limitations of our thinking. And it's by seeing, by reading literature or, or, or training a, a literary or an artistic eye, I feel like I get to see life and relationship unfold through the lens of a cinematographer rather than through the lens of a CEO who wants to measure everything and make sure that his stock is rising every single year and the return on investment is coming in and you know I'm getting more sex or more likes or more dates because I'm applying these principles. It's, it's much more of a, and I, and I think the the only way I asked, I asked this question to you a little while ago. Is it, is it a luxury or is it necessity? I think the only way I've been able to stick on this path with women so much for so long is because I've seen it through an artistic lens. Cause if yeah. I'm trying to get things right or hoping that everything works out my way, I'm going to be so frustrated and disappointed. But if I can literally, and we've got fun, beautiful, heartbreaking stories of having everything with a woman. And then two nights later with, somehow left town gone to the wrong place we find ourselves sleeping on the floor in snowy montreal it's like minus 15 degrees outside <laughs> no woman in sight and it and it's like why how have we lost this and ended up in poverty and an emotional hole of all of a sudden incredible huh right but incredible. but to, to be able to see life and relationship through these these eyes of a lover or eyes of an artist it changes everything and if you read in self-help, you're never going to learn how to see that. No, you're absolutely hundred percent nailing it, Jordan. It's, it, and I never thought about that, but you're right. If you can't see it, it's, it's, that's navel gazing. That's looking at yourself in, in the self-help mirror. And there's no, there's no sense of communion. There's no sense of artistic energy. And our Zemrata 2.0, 100% has to be about an artistic bent, you know, has to be. Because that's the way we learn. Like I said, you read literature, you read stories of, of pirates that went to sea, and then you, you learn something about the human condition, you know, human nature. So, yeah. But, and that's yeah, it. The, the human condition, I think, this, this is something that we don't talk about, which is clearly transmitted in the Alabaster Girl. Mm -hmm because you've got all these pieces that really ring with a subtle sadness. Like you talk about the beauty song of women and I know the amount of people that have, that's brought tears to the eyes of that women have a beauty song. No one has ever heard it, especially not themselves. Like very, very few women are actually conscious and understanding that they have a beauty song and they know what it is. Everyone reads that passage and it's like, it's true. You know, that's truth. Fuck. I had to put the book down and cry just contemplating that idea and feeling that the way that you wrote it and that notion of humanity. Um, so we've talked all these years about seduction and romance and the guys want to get their result. They want to get their outcome. You know, the we, result. All the great, we, we all want the great relationship with the alabaster girl and so on, but the humanity part of it. Um, I, I was talking with one of our guys from the mastery program and he yesterday, and he asked me, beautiful conversation, beautiful man, um, hell of, quite quiet, lots of depth, you know, very, very deep. And uh, he's working in a hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, we're having a talk. And he's like, I think I'm on a good path. But Jordan, have you got any thoughts, like any thoughts of guidance or any thoughts about how he can unfold? And I'm like, wow, you know, you're living in, you're working in a hospital in the UK at this moment in time. In the UK, everyone is at war with each other on the subtle level, right? It's, don't think it's breaking out into fist fights all over the place, but yeah, the, 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 the repressed anger and everyone's hostile judgment at each other, the stiff upper lip is kind of crumbling and all the shit's coming out. 
And he's working in a hospital where you've got the staff who are underpaid and overstressed and they're in their whole dynamic. And then you've got the patients who are trying to get better or not <laughs> yeah, exactly. in, in, in this whole circus, in this whole circus. And I'm like, <laughs> you're a witness in, on the battlefield, the battlefield of humanity. And, and I said, listen, there's nothing you need to really do differently to what you're doing because he's really got our principles in a really beautiful way. He's got them down. Um, he said, yeah, I don't know why. I've been here for three, three weeks already and uh, there just seems more women with their hair down and wearing makeup as every day goes by. Hmm. I, I told him there must be a really good-looking new guy that just started in the office the same day as he did. <laughs> <laughs> Probably hasn't met him yet. <laughs> Why are these women all wearing mini skirts all the time? <laughs> In here they weren't. <laughs> yeah, right. On my first day, I didn't see any of them. Now it's half the office, half the hospital. Yeah, and, and the, only, the only kind of coaching, quote unquote, that I could give him was just to slow down and be more and more present with the things that are actually happening. Like in every awkward meeting you have with a, a co-worker or every difficult moment you have with a, with a patient, like slow down and taste it fully. Hmm. Is that, that thing, masculine edge, right? You've talked about for many, many years, masculine edge holds a vibration. Like a man who's been out in the world and seen some things, he vibrates on a certain frequency and most women can feel that in a certain way. I'd right. like, like to tell the story of like the most experienced seducer in the world stood at a bar against the novice who's all in his head figuring out what he should say and how it all works and they're both sipping on a beer. And there's no difference to tell between them in terms of their body language and the fact that they sat at the bar not trying to talk to any women. But the one who's, you know, been all around the world and slept with thousands of women, he has this inner tattoo, right? He resonates on a certain frequency, which is composed of everything he's seen in his life. And the other guy doesn't. He just is vibrating on his own insecurity and self-centered right. thinking. Um, but I said to him, just slow down and taste every awkward moment in that hospital because it's going to inform your vibration and you'll see some things. And, it, and it's humanity. It's humanity. Yeah, right. The human to, condition, exactly. To stay, to stay very present in the face of people and yourself being pushed right to the edge of what you can handle, that, that, that's, that's yeah. beauty. That's the transformative thing. Wow. Yeah. Lots to think about, man. It's exciting times, you know, and, and I don't know. We're on the edge of something. I can feel it. And we can't articulate it. We're, we, you know, we talk in circles around things, but at least, and maybe we never will, but at least we're thinking about it. At least we're trying, right? At least trying to figure it out. You're, you're sitting in Thailand. I'm sitting in Italy. Yeah, it, it doesn't need, because I think anyone watching this who's thinking, shit, I always thought the Yaza Murata was abstract. This is getting even worse. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't actually need answers to many of these questions. And no, you've said you're, you know, by the time you're old, you look back and you say, well, you know, I, I I think it was Thoreau said that, you know, when you're a young man, you gather this building material around you and you're going to build these temples and cathedrals and you have this all plans and stuff like that. And when you get to your late middle age, you look around and you said, well, I, I guess I'll just build a woodshed because with my materials I gathered, you know? So, and, and, and so you build a woodshed instead. And it's when you get to the end of your life, when I get to be 90 years old, a hundred years old, I'm going to live to a hundred, by the way, everybody ever watching this when i get to 100 years old i'm going to be um i am certain that i'm going to look back and go man i don't know <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> i saw this video with his philosophers 97 mm. and he wrote a bunch of books when he was 40 and 50 and 60 on human conditions of that and he's old and he's sitting there and he's eating some eggs and stuff like that and he said you know I spent my whole life trying to find answers and trying to find meaning and I failed. That's exactly what he said. And I failed. 
And that was it. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> he was so certain in his, in his writing, in his books, and he wrote all these oh, books. yeah, yeah. So certain, and then he says, I tried to find meaning, and I wrote about it, and I spent my whole life dedicated to it. He wasn't a bricklayer. He was a philosopher that wrote books about the meaning of life and, and the meaning of death. And, and he gets to the end, he's sitting there, and he's just like, I, I spent my whole life trying to figure out this sense of, 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 of what meaning of life is. And I failed. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, was that joy when he said it? No. Despair? Like, Matter of fact. Matter just, of fact, yeah, just, just wow, just, yeah. wow. just like not surprised, not upset, not frustrated, just like, yeah, I failed. I tried and I failed, huh. you know, and I'm certain, you know, you look at, you might, they say the last words of Michelangelo, one of the last things Michelangelo said, or was it or Da Vinci, or Mike, I can't remember, one of those two, who are like the pinnacle of achievement, what we think of, and genius. Was it? I can't remember. I think it was da, da Vinci. And he said, the last words of Da Vinci were, oh, my biggest regret is before God and man, my work was crap. Hmm. I didn't do what I wanted before God, and I didn't do it before man. You know? My work was all crap. Incredible. So we're going to yeah. create this with a lot of pomp and circumstance, this fantastic world-changing Arza Murata 2.0, and we're gonna not take ourselves seriously in the process. <laughs> yeah, because you're not gonna get an answer, but you know, how presumptuous do we think we can figure out things, you know? Like, what is the answer of, are we gonna come up with an answer of, you know, why, do, why is the macro physics different than the quantum physics? What is the, that was Einstein spent the last 40 years of his life trying to come up with a grand unifying theory of everything, which is, you know, how to take quantum physics, the math of that, which is different than the math of the universe and how to combine it. And there's gotta be a way to combine it. Mm. Think about it. We just are, maybe our minds can't compre comprehend on that level. And, and, and we're presumptuous if we think we're going <laughs> to come up with some kind of grand unifying theory of everything. But, at least it's fun to think about and it's and it's uh when we're old we look back and say man we sure tried yeah 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 which is which is more than most people ever say so and within that trying there were moments yeah moments of little understandings and little aha moments and the whole thing is like and that's what i, I like i want to surround myself with people like that that's why the people we want to come into essentials and the amirati and and the arza Murata, I want them to have that bent, that kind of inquiry. Yeah. To sit in that inquiry to the day they die. That's the person I want to communion. I want to have communion with. The seeking so my, the my whole thing of coaching, coaching guys, you know, want to come do some coaching. I'm thinking, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that kind of coaching. I want to sit in the in the company of peers who are trying to sit in inquiry and trying to understand these these interesting things about life. They're seeking peak experiences. They're seeking frisson. They're seeking being impacted by exactly. the humanity, the extraordinary things in, in the world. Frisonism. Yeah. They're, lo they're looking for encounters with beauty that they can't really explain or describe. And that nobody's talking about and they can't get it from their school, their work, their, their colleagues their social circle and is absolutely and is no absolutely uninstagrammable <laughs> absolutely yeah so yeah. yeah it defies the lifestyle porn culture <laughs> yeah interesting huh you know with every year that goes by my energy for this picks up in a way energy oh, yeah. of feeling like i have a sense of purpose and i could say some good mission statements for what my purpose is but you know none of that ever cuts the mustard no. you know pur purpose is a feeling you wake up and it's running through your veins yeah. and you just want to do something or it's or it's less inspire others to be all they can be in excellence <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's something that flows through your veins. And I think I, a friend of mine said to me, um, how do you know when you're, uh, how do you know if you've had a good year in business? What are your metrics? You know, how much money, how many clients, all that kind of stuff. And I said, I think in a calendar year, if I have 10 moments where I spontaneously like cry because it was that exquisite what we did, that was a good year. There you go. So there's, exactly. the, there's the beauty metric to it. But I think what I'm getting at here, the start of essentials, which is the start of our training path and our conversation, because the Emirati really is an ongoing conversation, right? I think it's, first of all, it's an ongoing conversation with ourselves. You pay, sitting on your bed, laying at the ceiling, wondering, walking around the streets at night, how the hell does all this stuff work together? It's an inner conversation, like what is a life of beauty in the way that it is beautiful and meaningful to me? It's right. a conversation with others that are on the, on the same path, looking for answers, but... Um, uh, how can I say not even enjoying the questions? We're, we're kind of stuck with the questions. <laughs> like our, our constitution is in a su such a way that we're thinking along these lines and traveling along these lines and saying goodbye to parts of our lives that are uninspiring. So we can have more of this unknown that we're trying to figure out. It's just our constitution. I'm trying to so erase stuff gets in the way of that kind of thought process and that. Yeah. Yeah, like renouncing everything that gets in the way of this, this seeking to find my essence, which is my art, which is the thing that I want to give, which has inherent value. Um, this is an ongoing conversation. And the very first part of that training is, first of all, we talk about designing your life, right? Like what is a beautiful life and what is something that you want to move towards and what is stuff to renounce? That's the first thing that we talk about, yeah. The, and that's a, I mean, that's a massive conversation because it's like, who do I need to become as a man? What does that mean to me? Yeah. Um, if I am to live this life, who must I be? What must I embody to create that? So that, that's big. <laughs> that's, that's the first week of the course, but it, go, it goes a long time. The, 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 second, the second step... You're insane, Jordan. <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> Do, yeah, do that in a week. Um, the, the second step is how do I stop myself from being that and creating that life? The saboteur. Like, what yeah, are all. I'm like pausing and, and hesitating, yeah. Yeah, like, what are all these voices and bits of conditioning and, and who are all these other people living inside my head pretending that they're me, trying to do other things and getting in the way of the life that is true for me? So there's a process of weeding all that out. Of course, we do that together as a group, bit by bit, challenging each other. Uh, you know, you're saying that, but it's, that's your negative thought. It's not really true about who you are. Look at it in this way. We offer each other different perspectives. Invite, invite each other to see more deeply in different ways. The, the third one, the third theme, and I'm just going to go through four. I'm not going to talk through the whole program. The third one is to look at our lineage and to feel that we've got a archetypal blood of champions you talk about the blood of champions i love all this work that's coming out at the moment um jordan peterson's kicking a lot of it off but it's a a rebirth of jung and this archetypal yeah. um psychology and what i love about archetypes is it's not like oh yeah i really like that guy from that movie and um and i really like the lover archetype and don juan and Casanova, so I'm going to stick pictures of them on my fridge and hope to be like them one day. These archetypes actually have things that we can um, grasp hold of and embody and become. And there's a lot of different uh, things that we can and do the to, to do are, that. Are old and cultural agnostic. In other words, those archetypes, for instance, you know, young and 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 the the people that you know were uh, students of young. They, they went in, for instance, they examined all the myths of the world, Joseph Campbell and stuff, yeah. They examined the myths and the, you know, uh, there's a Russian guy, I can't remember his name. He examined a thousand Russian, thousands of Russian fairy tales. Mm. And he took out the seven elements that they all composed, you know, they all had, which is archetypal. So yeah, absolutely. It's in our DNA. 
and we, we can train it. You know, the warrior archetype is a very simple one to train, write a to-do list and then smash off every item on that to-do list and do it every day consistently on time. <laughs> you know, if, if you're doing that, you, you're embodying the warrior. The lover one is, can you stay very present in the moment? Like what constitutes a lover, right? And I think the key of it is I'm so present and enraptured in this moment. My attention is not going elsewhere. Because yeah. the lover is the one, like you say uh, in your book, numinous and luminous, beauty is a, uh, I can hang out in its current all day like a bird or something like that, right? Wow, so, that's all, man. That's yeah. Really cool. <laughs> it, wow. It's to, to be present in such a way that no moment of the experience is missed. And everything is tasted through all five senses. So what every, lo every great lover has in common is that his attention is not split. He's not talking to the girl and then thinking about what's his later on. Yeah. yeah. He's not talking to the girl and thinking, how's he going to get her into the bedroom? He's in that moment. Do you see, do you feel where we are right now? Look at this restaurant. Look at this food. Look at the surroundings. How good does that taste? You know, like right in the moment. So all the senses are activated. Anyway, so many practices and training to to master because all these parts of these archetypes that you're, that you're interacting with like that girl has never been in the presence of someone like that ever ever that's someone that's sitting there and tasting and, and and smelling that you know and in the moment in the present you know we talk about being present and someone who's really maximizing wants to maximize that experience with the girl wants her to be included in it Wants, wants him to have the best experience he can have that evening and her to be included in it too. So that you're, like I said, you're, you're heading towards, you're, you're, you're fighting for, and you're moving towards your, those peak experiences, that sense of free song. You're looking for it in every moment. And maybe you don't acquire it. Maybe you don't obtain to that. You, know, you don't get it. But you sure do your best to, find, to try, you know? Yeah. For her and for, and for you. That, that's the kind of man that a woman will, will say, I've never met anyone like this in my life. Yeah. I've never seen it before, man or woman, ever. Yeah. 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 And, and that can be simple. Um, you might be able to take a woman to the Ufficio Gallery and show her the Botticelli and guide her through that in a way that gives her free song. We did, um, we did a tea take ceremony. Her to the pub. Take her to the uh, pub and around the corner and <laughs> <laughs> we had that right so out, out in our little village in thailand they have an artisan fair and there's a thai couple that that cooks english baked goods and they make scotch eggs and sausage rolls so we went wow. there this morning we met matt popkin and his girl girlfriend up there they went to check out the sausage rolls they make <laughs> scotch eggs <laughs> i'm not kidding british scotch egg right you get from the bakery for 50p nothing to write home about they make scotch eggs and sausage rolls with so much love and attention. It's better than anything I've ever eaten in the UK. Wow. And my girlfriend dragged me down there this morning. She's like, this is our last, she's laughing at me now. This is our last Sunday. We need to get a scotch egg before there's no, ch and we sit with a scotch egg and cut it in half. And it's like, fuck. You're I'm like, babe, I, I never tasted it's anything Russian. like this. She's Russian. Yeah. And she's, she loves it. She's and, and the, and the people. <laughs> And, the, and then the people that run the, the scotch egg and the sausage roll stand, they're taking selfies with us at the end of it because they're like, these customers are so great. They adore everything we do. <laughs> they're having like this transcendent moment through our cooking. So they adore us and they want to have, they want to have the picture with us. That's funny. So, so yeah, I mean, those moments we have through just a cup of tea on the balcony, we made a little tea ceremony for fun and had a cup of tea and took it slow. Goosebumps, the whole thing. That's to get that present in the moment. And the, these are lover skills. So what's, what makes up the lover archetype? We can deconstruct and train. And we do that at length. Yeah, that's great, man. Because it's, if you can slow down in the moment that much, later will take care of itself. I mean, that's evident. That's true. That's evident. Very yeah. good, man. Yeah. <laughs> So and do then we have we, to do video, huh? We have to do video still, or we use this? No, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know I would have pulled my hair. 
No, this is it. Our nation. <laughs> and 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 then the fourth bit. I'm just going to go to four on the on the essentials course. The fourth theme is curiosity. For me, that this is what we've done on this in this conversation, Zan, is curiosity because the saving grace from a, a life of self-help and a life of self-recurring thoughts. Am I good enough? Am I this? Am I that? You know, that's always going to go on. We're always going to have parts of us, ourselves that are broken and parts of ourselves that are incomplete. The very nature of being a, a human with an ego is that it's incomplete perennially. The, the gift of curiosity, and we've just been speaking about what, like the future of art, the future of philosophy, the lost history of all kinds of stuff. Um, what's going to happen with algorithms and bionic chips, the fall of the West and the, the rising of the nation states. Um, where else have we been? The, the, the hospital, literature. Yeah. Uh, uh, the humanity of that girl her beauty song and her motivation and who she is underneath it all and what she might wonder in a quiet moment that she never tells anyone about. As soon as a man becomes curious about all these diverse and sundry things, he's saved from his own internal self chatter. That's right. Because ultimately, you know, whatever we think, I don't care if you're 19 years old or 90 years old, what's behind all of our thought processes is the concept of salvation. How do we be saved? And nobody in this modern world is talking about that concept at all. It's, it's stripped out, you know, religion talked about it and philosophy talked about it and the Greeks talked about it, but it's been stripped out of our modern society. The concept of salvation, how do we, how do we become saved? How do we feel that there's, yeah, Exactly what you're saying. So curiosity is salvation. Exactly. I'll, sta I'll stand up and say that because if you can actually externalize all your awareness, like put all your awareness on something else that isn't you, you're instantly saved. <laughs> and that can be a woman, but it could be a scotch egg. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get a woman, but <laughs> <by that. laughs> And, and you don't have to go to Florence to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> no, it's true. It's like, and, and that's where it has to go, that kind of concept and that kind of thinking. And I want to be around that kind of thinking for myself, my own education, and my own edification. I want yeah. to know. I want, I want to explore these ideas. So, I mean, like, you talk, you know, you, Proust talked about, he wrote an entire essay on the madeleine that he was eating. You know, he's eating this little madeleine, which is a little French type of pastry yeah. cookie thing. And his whole life, his whole childhood came back to him. He wrote an entire thing about that. And he said, that's, his, that's the measure of man. That's the measure. So you talking about the Scotch egg is as good as anybody talking about anything that's excellent in this world. Because your girl is saying, let's go have a Scotch egg, you and me, Jordan. You and me together in communion, together and do this before we leave this country, right? And it's like, what else is there? Yeah. You get to see her smiling face. You get to enjoy something that you knew as a child in England, uh, in this foreign country. And you get to, the, 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 the collusion of all that together, the accretion of all those elements together is the measure of life, you know? Yeah. Incredible, man. And I, know, and I know that any time that she's a little bit thinking about the past, she's going to be thinking of the Scotch egg and wishing she was yeah. back in Thailand having the Scotch egg. So the, these, these are the secret Maybe. things that women are thinking about when you're not around. <laughs> I was thinking yesterday, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my yeah. hotel room here and, and I'm thinking, and, and something popped up to me. I can't remember what it was. I was, I was reading something. And if somebody, if you all of a sudden you had a million dollars and I'm sitting in Florence, what would I do different than I'm doing now? I, would I eat different food? Uh, no. Would I, you know, would I get a different hotel room? Uh, no. Would I get, you know, like what, like 
at some point you go, wait a minute, that money can't buy that experience. What I'm trying to say is what we're chasing, we're trying to chase that, that, that solution. We're, you know, we, we, we buy hope. That's what we're trying. That's what we spend our money on hope. We're spending your money on hope, you know, so that I can get that moment with a girl with a scotch egg. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to buy that with, with their, with trying to get a better job, trying to get a, you know, accumulate better car, better things, you know, and, and, or trying even self-help is trying to buy that too. Trying to buy hope. We spend our money, we spend our energy and our time on hope. And because you cannot buy that with money. That moment that, of your girl saying, let's go have a scotch egg, you and me together, you could be a billionaire. And it wouldn't make that experience. You, you couldn't, do that experience differently. It's bizarre, man. Yeah. Nobody knows it, you know? I mean, with, with all the men I speak to all the time, it's every two week vacation or every one year of backpacking is all saved up for, agonized for, um, journeyed for, paid for in the hope that there will be one night with one girl that yeah. makes the whole thing worth it. Yeah, exactly. Incredible. That was all my vacations in the past, you know, like when I was young. Yeah. I Save up money, go to Mexico and like, and, and not sleep because you did not want to miss that moment. You would not sleep. There's no way you're going to sleep because you got to go on the beach and, and you're like, eh. and then you got to go out that night. And, eh. and, but you cannot stop and you cannot stop because you don't want to miss that moment because you came away to try and experience something that you could never have. You know, you try to buy it. Incredible. Yeah. You got a good sunburn. That's it. Yeah. Well, there you go. Man. Well, I think with us in this talk, we'll see if Serene can magically chop these up into four <laughs> useful parts <laughs> plan, <laughs> and, th right? and, and think of a good title for them. And then if you're watching and this is <laughs> for you, um, I'll say this with total conviction. We're, we're talking about something very mysterious we're talking about the ineffable and we're approaching it and we're living it and we're shaping our lives around it and tasting it quite often, quite often. This is the meaning and whole juice of life compared to this dating coaching and some relationship coaching is quite easy. It's quite easy. And whatever your questions are with, meeting women and dating and connecting will solve all of those along the way. Like they all get solved during the conversation along the path. You'll have Zan's help. You'll have my help. You'll have the help of 400 plus brothers all keen to muck in and mastermind where you're at. But the real path is this. And if you resonate with everything or a lot of <laughs> what we've been talking about and the way that we've been talking about it as well, this delightful, curious wondering about what's really going on and what does the future bring and what is a, an incredible, enrapturing way of life, then join the Amirati. Mm. Join it. Sign up for Essentials, 13-week program. We covered the first four weeks. There's more. You can check out the landing page if you want more info. Starting um, in a couple of weeks, the next class. Starting soon. Yeah, you'll be part of a group of like-minded men. And if you make it to the end, you'll be part of the Amirati proper. And this is our brotherhood, our society, our group of men that are, what are we doing? Turning around, turning, turning around from the, the crazy um, uh, fighting, warmongering that's going on between different tribes and eking out a much more memorable life and we meet in person twice a year it's an online community but we meet in person twice a year in romania and we've got groups all around the world doing little meetings and it's a it's a real modern days gentleman's club yeah yeah fantastic so there, i mean not everybody's you know called to this kind of conversation and a lot of people might not say well it doesn't apply to me but that's but if 
if, if it does, then that's who I want to, that's, I want to hear that, that voice, you know, I want to hear that, I want to meet that guy. That's a cool guy. Yeah. That's somebody that, you know, that it's such a rare thing. It's yeah. so rare. And, and it's someone to carry on this work. You know, as you say, Sir Roger passed away a couple of weeks ago. Torches come onto you. The torch is in our tribe. And it's, yeah. and it's not about us and it's not about you, but it's about the carrying forth of culture yeah. and beauty that is important to your heart and that you want to see more of in the world as a gift to the other people that come into your life, family, children, women, of course, and your friends. Exactly. In your workplace. Hmm. Yeah.